Music, the sweet assembly of sounds the ancient Greeks called the gift of the gods. It's a vital part of cultures around the world and can be a rewarding part of any day. Some people of extraordinary talent have even risen to fame and fortune as what is known as musicians. You have chosen to learn how to make music yourself with this video. We're going to teach you how to play the cowbell. The cowbell is a rewarding instrument to master. This wonderful percussive instrument has many intricacies, but you'll find it's easy to learn. The first thing to learn is the proper way to hold the cowbell. To start with, here are two examples of how not to hold the cowbell. Hold your hand as shown here. Now make a claw with your hand like so. Think of an eagle's claw. That's it. Now simply insert the shallow end of the cowbell into position and squeeze. Give a few rough taps to make sure the cowbell is secure. Are you still holding the cowbell? You've done it! You can now properly hold a cowbell. There are a number of positions you can play the cowbell. This is called seated position. It's popular because it provides adequate spinal support for the cowbell player. Some players prefer standing position. Prone position is a somewhat unorthodox position favored by Germans. This position, which is very popular these days, is known as Bruce Dickinson's position. Find a position that's most comfortable for you and we'll begin playing. First, you must find due north with a compass. Modern science has proven that a cowbell sounds its best when facing due north. If you're facing another direction, you may notice a significant drop off in quality of the cowbell sound. A drumstick, usually made of wood, is used to strike the cowbell, but you can explore other items to strike a cowbell. We, however, recommend starting with a normal drumstick. Let's begin playing. We'll start out with a very recognizable piece of music. Note where the player chooses to add the cowbell. There. See how riveting the cowbell can be? It adds that little extra bit of magic to any music. Let's try a different melody. This time, modern music. Here is the song without the presence of cowbell. And now, with the cowbell. Be sure to play along at home. Excellent. Now you're on your way to playing the cowbell. Remember, practice makes perfect. It's said you can learn a lot about someone by walking a mile in his shoes. The same is true for a cowbell, except a cowbell has no shoes or feet. So simply learn by walking a mile and playing your cowbell. Soon you'll have found that you too can master the cowbell. And once mastered, you'll find you want to hear the cowbell more and more. Is this on? Yep. No? Maybe? Yeah? That's not mine. Hello. Oh, it does work. I just can't use my phone, so it's just... Okay. Is that too loud or... Yeah, I got this at, at Dundee, but I yeah, can't hear yeah, that. Yeah. <coughs> Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, uh, I hope you enjoyed Ian's really bad cowbell playing there. Um, it was great. <coughs> <coughs> so the more we get these kind of talks, the better he'll get. And hopefully this right. time next year he'll be able to wait, do wait, keep wait, time. Wait, 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 wait. <coughs> keep time. That's the only thing you've got to try and do with a percussive instrument, right? Okay, so we're the beer farmers. Thanks for having us. Lovely to be back in, in Edinburgh. We're 80% I'm coming to come that in a second. Okay. Um, as you can probably tell, I was born in Edinburgh. Um, I actually was born in Edinburgh in 1973, um, and I moved down to Yorkshire in 1975, so I am actually Scottish. Shut up. Um, 
<laughs> so it's a privilege personally for me to be here back in the, the city I was born, delivering a talk for you guys. Um, we are the beer farmers. So anybody under 18 in the room? <clears throat> okay. We've made a solemn promise, um, and we all keep our promises, right? That we'll try and keep it as clean as we can. But Andy Gill's here. <coughs> he's the he's a swear farmer. I'm a resident bastard. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> so, in the interest of decency, we put a parental advisory up um, in the languages of common nation state threat actors. So, just keep you make you feel at home. <coughs> so, there may, there may well be a little bit of foul language, but we'll. Keep it in context of the, of the subjects that we're discussing. <clears throat> so, uh, we'll do quick intros. I'm Mike. Uh, I'm an a, a information security analyst. I work for a company called Zen Internet, who are an ISP based in the north of England. Um, John's unable to join us. He's, uh, he's Belgian, lives in Belgium, and the travel was just difficult, too difficult for him to, to manage this time around. Um, but he's upset about it. He's self-flagellating at home at the moment, so that's, that's really uh, big of him. Um, Ian? Yeah, so I'm, uh, what, what did I do? What, oh, 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 like down here? Oh, like an old person at an auction. <laughs> it's, uh, oh yeah, it's so nice to see all of you. Yeah, so I'm a fat hobbit on Twitter, love a follow, uh, and please follow the bill, beer farmers. Um, yeah, what do I do? Uh, I write assertive emails that try not to offend anybody, um, for a living. Um, and try to move security through a multi-billion dollar company. I guess that's the best description. Yeah, some more. Hey, I'm uh, Sean. Um, I'm uh, in AppSec, uh, a lead security engineer uh, for a large security company. I'm mainly shouting at developers and that. No, no. Um, trying to help developers. Um, Andy? Hey, uh, I'm Andy Gill, I swear a fuck ton, but I'm also a pen tester at Pentest Partners, uh, so, sorry. Uh, not, not, not sorry for being a pen tester, just sorry for swearing. Um, <laughs> I also wrote a book, some of you might have heard of it, it's called Breaking Into Security, Learn the Ropes 101, it's not about bondage, it might, it's, it's got some swearing in it. Um, I've got a few copies with me if you fancy it, it's five quid. Give me some money, I need a new car exhaust. Cheers. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, guys. Um, and as Ian said, that's our handle for the beer farmers. So we post bits and pieces, rock and roll stuff. Um, anybody show of hands know about the APT bot that we've got? <coughs> a few people know about it. So that was um, that was an idea that, that Ian came was with. Um, as in a fever dream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is a former conservative politician, UK conservative politician called Louise Mensch. Um, she's kind of decamped to New York now. And a couple of weeks ago, she got all stuffy on Twitter and accused Malware Jake uh, of being indicted in the US for creating or distributing Kronos. <coughs> so she got the wrong guy. Um, he, Those Malware yeah. people are all the same. They're all, yeah. we're, we're all bad guys. <laughs> we're all dicks. <coughs> so Ian came and said, why don't we do something like that and just randomly accuse InfoSec professionals... <laughs> Um, of completely made up malware. Of completely made up malware from completely made up APT groups. And so if you follow the beer farmers, you'll see a few times a day an automated accusation sent out to a member of the information security community, um, accusing them of, of being a bad actor. Some people got really offended. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, I don't think they got offended. I think they thought it was real. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we had to fine tune it a little bit and we've hashtagged it with just for fun because it's just, Just for, for fun, fun, right? Yeah. So if you do see your name um, appear on the Bear Farmer's Twitter, um, it's not real, unless it's, well, it is it's real, well, in which case we busted you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, just a quick look at that there. So, so I, lifted this, um, I lifted that quote from Mark... Zuckerberg saying privacy is a social norm of the past. Um, all right. Well, according to Facebook, yeah, I think it seems to be. Now we like Facebook because they are really a, a gift that keeps on giving from an information security point of view. And we talk about them a lot. All the beer farmers talks that we've done have had either a small or a large section on, on Facebook. Um, we work closely with Stu who gave you a keynote earlier uh, on his many hats club platform we've done a couple of panel talks on there we're going to continue to do them and facebook's never never far away from what we're talking about <coughs> a bunch of dicks, 
Yeah, and he's the, the, the ringleader of the dicks. <laughs> Dick King. And so because there's news breaking almost, it seems, every day, if not every week, around Facebook's antics, then the current perception, I think, is generally that Facebook are, are evil core. And um, I think, show of hands, who agrees with that statement? Yeah, all right, maybe just over half, perhaps. Um, trustworthiness is zero, or less than zero, if that's possible. Um, who has a Facebook account? Me too. <coughs> um, who, who believes, I believe, but who in the room believes that Facebook and other organizations similar need regulating government regulation, or if not, international standards? Cool. <coughs> And who, on the back of recent transgressions in the last year, 18 months, you know, 50 million records that got lost because of Cambridge Analytica and the data manipulation there for political gain, when that all went public and things that have happened since, who deleted Facebook as a consequence of it? So Sean did. One or two people did. Okay. Interesting. It's a picture of uh, Zuckerberg looking a bit upset in front of Congress where he was asked a lot of questions and didn't give a lot of answer. <coughs> So yeah, we talk about numbers. I'm just going to flick through these, really. But yeah, they've 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 had some pretty big numbers up until the end of last year. So we're talking well over about pushing a good hundred million records have gone. The fifty million there was Cambridge Analytica. Um, Twenty nine million records were because of lost authentication tokens, and that happens because relentlessly you are encouraged to sign up to apps using your Facebook credentials. <clears throat> For a lot of people, we go with the old usability versus security usability wins approach and that 29 million were actually not facebook users per se there were people that had apps that had plumbed in they'd plumbed into the apps using their facebook credentials so that happens but on top of all that <coughs> we see increasingly that they seem to be pretty cool with hate speech and it drives me a little bit insane so when somebody says something really terrible about someone and it can be across anything it can be ethnicity it can be around sexuality it can be around political persuasion <laughs> Like uh, a mass shooting. Yeah, for example. Uh, and then they, they, their response is really quite slow. And they're generally, well, we're trying, we're doing everything within our power to remove this content. But yeah, weeks later, you can still somehow find it. I think Cambridge Analytica and things like leave.eu demonstrate that they're happy with dodgy political things going on on their platform. Um, that's my take on it. This isn't about politics, guys. <clears throat> no. We, we are apolitical. We don't, we don't, we're not into politics. All right. <coughs> okay. Um, has anybody had successfully somebody removed from Facebook that's been giving them some shit or you've had a problem with it? No, because it's really hard. It's incredibly difficult to do. And so they persist. And of course, what's your quote about if it's free, then you are? Oh, yeah. If it's, f if it's free, then you are the product it's for any, any platform, not just Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, any, any social media, anything that you don't need to pay for, your data is getting sold, whether you like it or not. GDPR, yeah, it sort of helps. On, I don't know. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Fuck it. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we've got a video and Andy contributed this. It's not the only thing I've he contributed. It personally, it's just <laughs> so we'll just shut up for a minute. This is uh, again Mark Zuckerberg in a, a Glasgow Congress court. So um, and, and I just started Facebook, and I was just wanting to sell shoes and dresses and stuff, and get some likes, and put up some videos, of wee cats, and then I all got pure to hon. And then before I knew it, um, Trump was president, and Brexit happened, and turns out folk was using all my addresses. And see, to be honest, I'd be happy selling three pairs of socks down the bars, three for a pound, three for a pound. Or this has just got a bit of pure to hon. I like likes, I like cats, I like videos of wee monkeys holding accordions. And, you know, I don't know why I'm getting my boss boot out of this. It was not really even my fault. And I, I never even meant anything to go wrong. Before I knew it, Trump was president. I never knew people were stealing all the intelligence and all the addresses. None of the with me. I was just doing my bit. I just, I just like writing code and that and algorithms and stuff. I think it is your fault, son. At the end of the day, you've kept all people's information and you've gave it to everybody and now we've got that bammy bastard in the White House. So I think it might just be your fault. So stop trying to get out of it, you wee ball bag. <laughs> <coughs> OK. 
just want to add I'm on Facebook. Um, who's had the recent news about Facebook this week? Oh, yesterday. So, yeah. So those who don't know, um, Facebook, uh, well, it actually came out with uh, Krebs. Um, and I think if Krebs didn't announce it, probably Facebook wouldn't have said anything. Um, Facebook had plain text passwords stored on their systems available, they say, only internally. Now, the worrying thing for me is, out of that whole thing, they have not forced users to reset their passwords. They're basically saying, oh, it's fine, don't worry. And it's like, how many employees, how many employees worldwide in Facebook? Like 10,000 employees, right? Or, and it's like, so do you know someone that knows someone in the Bay Area, you know, that works at Facebook and all of a sudden, you know, your account could be accessed by a person acting on behalf of somebody else to get at all of your personal information. So I think this is a really huge issue because a lot of that personal information is really private and in the wrong hands. It can do a lot of damage, can open you up for social engineering attacks or, you know, attempts at fraud and other things. Uh, sorry. And, and just again to reiterate that um, people, many people reuse the same password over and over. So it may seem not a big issue, but if you're using the same password for your banking and that, it a, becomes a big issue. So we're talking about 600 million records. <clears throat> that was the, the number of records reported in the, in the breach, quite a high number. Uh, which brings us on this kind of slide, really. But that data was only available to devs, okay? So that's all right. <clears throat> no big deal. But it takes you back to the original point that Zuckerberg made, which is privacy is a social norm of the past, as far as in his head. Okay. So <clears throat> this is this slide, we changed it last week. Um, in previous um, shows that we've done, gigs we've done, it said that there are, uh, reckon there were at least three breach records per every man, woman, and child on the planet. 21 billion. I had a chat with Troy Hunt about it, given that if anyone knows about the likely number of breaches and records, it's going to be him, right? And he said, yeah, I think you're way off. We're talking pushing 80 billion around the planet. Now, that's an absolute atomic number, mind-blowing number as far as I'm concerned. <clears throat> and it ups the game because what we're talking about is, in fact, around 10 records per every man, woman, and child on the planet. And that is... Absolutely insane. And the footnote or the caveat that Troy gave me was, that's what we know. Those are the numbers we know about. And that is literally the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, this is the good part of the show. So another show of hands, if you don't mind. Who knows who these guys are? <clears throat> Not too many people, know. Okay. They don't work for them. None of you work. So they're a conservative US-based organization. So they are um, a Trump-supporting outfit, and they attract members who are um, allied with the conservative movement in the US. So they're trying to make America great again. That's their aim in their own uh, perspective of it. But like any extreme organization, they're a little bit sensitive to criticism, and that's who they are. <clears throat> So, who knows Robert, uh, Baptiste Robert, French researcher, great guy, pioneer, a trailblazer of what we're all about. He goes by the name of Elliot Alderson, takes the name from the, uh, the character in, in Mr. Robot. Um, <clears throat> his handles F Society, done in kind of leet stuff. He, def he found a vulnerability in one of their ap mobile applications and took the, the uh, responsible route of letting them know about it. The problem is that they reacted in an extremely negative way, and very publicly, and said that he, uh, they wrote a blog accusing him of being an anti-conservative hacker, and put that out on the internet, told, told the world that they reported him to the FBI for being a hacker, and he'd stolen their data, and all this kind of bullshit. <clears throat> so can we talk a little bit about what he did? Okay, so who here's familiar with that APK file? Right? Okay. So... Um, there's lots of utilities, including hex editors, that you can open up an APK file and look inside. That's what he did. Okay? That's his crimes. For which he could be sentenced to, what, 20 years in a federal prison. Absolutely. <coughs> so, 
Um, after that, we sort of kicked off, as in the community kicked off. Um, I think Ollie Hoff kicked off. <coughs> um, Andy Andrew Tierney kicked off. Uh, Cyber Gibbons from the P- PTP, one of Andy's colleagues. I kicked off, and it, it kind of got a little bit messy because pylons ensued. When do they not? ensue when there's a bit of drama in Infosec. The Infosec drama clock got reset about 15 times in that particular day. <clears throat> For anyone that doesn't know, the Infosec drama clock is this chap's creation, Stuart here. Just wave up and let people know that you're there. Um, one of the reasons the beer farmers exist is because of Infosec drama and too much of it. And so we thought, well, fuck it, let's put a group of people together and have a laugh. I'm, I'm warming you up, mate. Yeah. Um, and so that's part of what we did. Before we actually developed any kind of plan, we thought, let's just have some fun. Yeah. And part of that was uh, trying to cure some of the drama. A bot that Stuart's created now is the Infosec Drama Clock. And if you hashtag Infosec Drama Clock, it will reset the clock to zero. And it's it's never gone zero. it's never gone above zero. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Was that before you told anybody it existed? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, cool. Um, a, a, an individual called Fa- Falinor or Fallen Hour, however you pronounce it, appeared. This was on Saturday evening, last Saturday evening. And there was a huge troll fight went on, him being the troll, and us being the, the kind of defenders of the, of the faith, as it were. So we're talking Cyber Gibbons, myself, a bunch of other people, just trying to close this guy down. And it, it was... I was getting a few messages from fellow bear farmers around, just leave it alone, go to bed, forget about it. But I, and normally that would be my response, but this time around I was a bit pissed off because of Elliot's good work and he was getting trashed. Not only was he being trashed by 63 Red, <clears throat> he was being trashed by so-called security experts and I was having none of this. So we looked into the guy and we, we found we did a, a lot of OSINT on the chat, which you'll have just heard all about in Stu's talk, <clears throat> and we found out ultimately that he was a bit of a white supremacist. We found a ranty tweet, straight, a thread about why white males in the US have got zero opportunities these days and it's a disgrace and the, the country's gone to shit. Now that's enough white supremacy bullshit for me. We, we doxed that out a little bit and he kind of went quiet and we've not, I don't believe heard from him since. So. <coughs> so I think... <laughs> you could have waited until I turned the microphone on. <laughs> shit. <coughs> uh, and I think, you know, not to be self-righteous, but I think we won that battle and it was one worth fighting in my opinion. And then I went to bed. All good. Thank you. <clears throat> so collect, collection one. Who's familiar with collection ha- number one and the ensuing collections? Yeah, not too many people. But yeah, that, that was a bunch of aggregated, cobbled together data that was found. I'm not going to let Andy talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, yeah. Yeah, so the collection dumps was essentially the biggest public available dumps that were released released into the kind of public sphere. There, you can have download you can still download them on Torrent. Um round about a terabyte, terabyte and a half of data. Uh, and they rec- at the moment like there's still people trawling through the data, but they reckon there's about seven hundred and seventy three unique billion sorry, seven hundred and seventy three billion unique records, which is is quite a few. Uh, but this is records from things like Bitcoin forums, pornography, gambling uh, breaches, things like Facebook, Twitter, like the, the breaches we talked about earlier on, the Facebook things that they, they're in there, LinkedIn's in there, MySpace. Anyone remember MySpace? <laughs> yeah. They lost. They deleted all the songs last week. Yeah, yeah they did. Upgrade. Lot, lots of lots of different things, but the thing is, it's not just usernames and passwords. Because often when you see breaches, it's like, oh yeah, my password's been breached. But this was like personal identifying information. There was credit card data in there. There was Bitcoin addresses. Bitcoin wallets, like lots of stuff. Those Bitcoin wallets are probably now off to some nation state, probably Russia, um, or other nation states are available, but like, <laughs> they're, they're, they're probably off there, the loads of money lost, yeah. But essentially, it's a fuck ton of data, and yeah. It's, is that an SI unit? That is, that is a unit, yep. Is that a British unit? That, that is, that is Zephyr Fish's, uh, the trademarked and shit. Um, but yeah. It, yeah, that's essentially what it is. Has anyone actually trolled through the data or had a look at it at all? Yeah, you've got the data. Apart from me having the data sort of illegally. It's not illegal, but like having a lot of data under GDPR apparently is illegal. But it's not really because I'm not using it. I'm not selling it. If anyone wants it for free, they can have it for free. Cause I'm not gonna, yeah. Right, I'm going to run I think, now. I think, <laughs> I think you just described why it's all in breach of GDPR there, but we'll move on quick. Yeah. <clears throat> 
<laughs> but again, it, you know, the tip of the iceberg analogy, I, I, I was going to remove that because it's like the shittest analogy, isn't it? The, tip, oh, the me- metaphor or whatever. <clears throat> it's got to exist. Like, but I felt better about it when, when memes came up in Stu's talk and I thought, well, if we've got an app, if he's doing memes. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So if memes are cool, then tip of the iceberg metaphors are equally cool. But we, again, we only know what we know, and that lot there is the stuff that we don't. <clears throat> so this is a website called Information is Beautiful, and it's finally served over HTTPS. It wasn't previously, but it's a nice visualization that I find really useful uh, to take into the workplace and demonstrate to people how bad this problem actually is and how far back it goes. And if you look at this, <clears throat> and I see in a room full of people at, at my workplace, people's faces kind of sink the, as they realize that they were an Equifax customer or they have a Twitter account or like Ian, they're a regular Marriott user. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but the point being is we're all in here somewhere. Yeah. And that's just something that we've got we've to get, get used to and move on from. It's your favorite. All right. Well, this is the uh, the drum solo part of the beer farmers. And just if you were confused, we're a band in the sense of like Robin Hood and his merry band, a band of brothers, not technically an, a band with any musical talent. Although Mike worked in that industry for a while. Low to average, Low to average. sure. I'd say medium time. Okay, medium time. All right. Um, this is the Helm Gibbons. Who has heard of the Helm Gibbons? Security vendor. Okay, awesome. So this is what happens when security researchers confront companies that aren't well trained in the art of engaging with the security research community. And let me be honest here. Sometimes we are a little bit difficult and we may be special snowflakes. Okay. But the reality is, is that if you approach a company saying there is a vulnerability, it's going to go one of two directions. They're going to be receptive or they're going to be not. And when they're not, this escalates into what I like to call the full-blown cyber shitstorm. Okay? Now, we've seen this. Now, as you can see in our red 63 um, example, 63 red, we already were at a level three with legal threats by vendor against security researcher, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So we had already escalated to there. This is not necessary for vendors to do. This is why it is so important that you look through and look for the disclosure, responsible disclosure um, process. And in some cases, we saw an almost a, an unprecedented event about three months ago where a security researcher who had been actively engaged with a company was physically assaulted by the company at an information security event. Did you guys hear about this? Yeah. So anyways, it was uh, working on online gambling systems, and they found that there was really no security on this gambling system. It was the points system for casinos, and they showed they could change the amount of points people had. Their personal data was FTP'd in and out. There was like literally no security on these consoles inside casinos, which you would think, hey, it's a casino. Why would I want, you know, how to have IT security on my fish tank? Why would I want that? Right. So anyways, what happened was the company not only was not even up front with this security researcher, but actively denigrating them, doxing them, do, and doing everything. After the security researcher went to the FBI, voluntarily disclosed what he had, and the FBI actually facilitated a meeting with the vendor. So level six is getting punched in the face. Because that is just completely unacceptable. So as security researchers, I'm going to hand the mic over to Sean, because Sean has had a lot of experience with this, and he's got a couple of stories and anecdotes to tell. Thanks, Ian. Um, so from my perspective, I haven't had negative in terms of being harassed, but I've had essentially the cold shoulder. Um he here was aware of 500 px, the breach. Okay, not many. So they got breached. Um, 
they send out a load of password reset emails. Fine. I mean, that's the right thing to do. But the problem is the link in there was HTTP. Probably something you don't want to do when you suffered a breach. So I contacted 500px, said, look, guys, um, please look into this. No response. The only response was, yeah, someone's looking into it. Yeah. Um, other companies, again, major companies, um, same thing over and over and over. You either don't get a response or they simply fix it behind your back and that's it. Um, companies need to realize that when researchers are coming up to them, it's helping them out. It's not trying to take a dig at the company. If we were really that interested in taking a dig at the company, guess what? We'll go on, I don't know, the dark web or find some way of making some financial gain out of it. We're not gaining anything out of it. We're helping the company. <coughs> so here's some typical behavior that we see. So this was a kind of half the press. So it's a bit of a, a, an interchange between Ian and Ken Munro, another colleague of Andy's from Pentas Partners. <coughs> Work. Um, yeah. If you got down to the London thing and you saw them doing the pen testing of the ships, that was just mind blowing. That was really okay. Can you preview? Can't you can't. You can't. Yeah, of course. So this was um, what I saw happening to a lot of communities. This thread. Kane took off with a lot of people wading into it on both the absurd and the positive, but you know. What we're finding in the industry right now is we have a communication difficulty. We have huge brains. All of us here have huge brains and can understand the implications of something like remote code execution. Businesses and business people don't. And we need to understand that um, in order to have a conversation with those people, we need to educate them in, in, a, in a collaborative way and not just like scare the crap out of them. Don't that too, though. I mean, we're scared about the yeah, crap. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Just to make the point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of scaring the crap. So we, we kind of hope that I'd get the reaction that it got. Um, show of hands who doesn't know who this guy is. Okay, that's cool. So he's John McAfee and he invented cybersecurity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the John McAfee. Um, he's also currently He's a wanted man in Australia, Australia America, for not paying taxes, and he admits that he's, he's not paying taxes. He's on a boat. He, yeah. <laughs> he's somewhere, somewhere between the USA and Venezuela or somewhere. He also may or may not have murdered his neighbor, but that's another story. One of the things he does is a lot is lends his name to things um, that he sees are, are valuable. <clears throat> so... Cryptocurrency is a big thing for him. Um, he's a, what's it, what's it called? Pump and shunt or? <laughs> Pump and dump. Pump and dump, that's the one. Pumping and shunting is probably the same sort of thing, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> and yeah, he's made a lot of money out of it. He, apparently he's got no money anymore. He has his asset free, according to a recent testimony. But recently he started becoming very active. He's now a, a likely presidential candidate for the 2020 elections in the USA. If you follow him on Twitter, I don't, but if you follow him on Twitter, <coughs> then, yeah, yeah blocked. I'm blocked. And, and kids, if you do a lot of drugs, what happens to you in later life is this. <coughs> what he said. All right, a really quick show of hands. Who's blocked by John McAfee on Twitter? <laughs> well done, you, Mike. No idea, but I think it might have been some of the things that I uh, did with your guys oh, yeah. that got me into trouble with him. But BitFi, right, okay, it was a portable cryptocurrency wallet with hashtag unhackable, and he went on, on social media and said, guys, this is unhackable, I say so, trust me, I know what I'm talking about because I invented cybersecurity. Um, and other companies similar, uh, in October, Pandora Car Alarms, uh, similar sort of time, Taplock, um, the, the, the top three there, and this isn't really a sales pitch for his organization, but it just, but it just so happens that they, did their business on them. Um, it's still blue. It's still blue. Uh, and Trustify is one that was it you and you and John came came up with, and they were a, a company telling you that let's encrypt, so it's bad. We've got a little slide about that. But the general point is, just do not 
as a vendor or a creator of something ever go out there and tell the world that it's unhackable. Just don't do it. All, all you get really is a free pen test a bunch <coughs> of people shout at you soon. Uh, yeah. You know those, you know those um, trucks that come out when their airplanes are about to crash and stuff like that? Yep. They get that, but instead of foam, it's loaded with shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. I, I couldn't agree more. That's the trigger word. <clears throat> But years come and go, and the th- and it just keeps happening. No one learns. Well, actually, Bitfight Bitfi learned. So here's a, a, a tweet. I I went to war with Bitfi on a number of things. They posted a really cynical picture of a guy with a noose around his neck, um, and I lost my shit about that. And I piled. I personally piled on Bitfi, and eventually, a few CEOs later and a few CTOs later, they found a little bit of sense um and this tweet kind of speaks of that speaks volumes about how their attitudes changed somebody else or maybe one of the other organizations had gone uh, on with the old hashtag unhackable thing and their response was quite good very self-effacing so best not call your product unhackable going forward <coughs> this is called redemption by the way i agree you know yeah we give them another chance now yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't use the product. But no, no. God, no. <coughs> and you wouldn't want to work for them, would you? No. Yeah. No. In the, maybe their comedy department, I don't know. But um, one one good thing that did come of it, in, on top of the fact that they, they saw their own light, was that the pilot I did ended up with Hackers Mental Health getting a $10,000 um, donation, which I was very pleased with. Okay, And I can confirm, they confirmed they did receive that money, so it wasn't just a lot of PR. It actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> Sean? Sean, there you go, mate. Sean. All right. Um, so this started off with John, the other BF farm who's not here. Um, I, I forgot what it was exactly. It was something around the certificate related tweet, and suddenly Trustified did something that again, please don't do this. Thread Jacqueline used used the tweet to try push their own product. Just tell them what that means. Thread so. Those who don't know Threadjacking, I post something on Twitter saying, um, I like cats. And some company, a pet shop goes, oh, we have thousands of cats for sales and you should buy it from this person. It's using a, a, a tweet to push your own gain. <laughs> and using cats. Um, so what these guys did is they were um, blasting out Let's Encrypt, uh, Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt, in my opinion, has done one of the most for our industry uh, out of many companies. Uh, the fact that they the world's largest CA um, is testament to that. Free certificates, automated, they've changed the game. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we have so many sites on HTTPS is due to Let's Encrypt. So they're doing a fantastic job. These guys came along and said, Let's Encrypt certificates are rubbish. Don't use them. Use our EV certs where you pay, I don't know, hundreds of pounds uh, for two years. Um, and they had this whole list. Um, the full list is not there. But they basically went through different points trying to um, basically rip off uh, let, uh, Let's Encrypt certificates. And I went through each one and basically they're all uh, not true, uh, totally based off of uh, Lars. Um, and also in the top there, uh, let's just say there's s- slight trademark infringement um, at the top. Cool. So if anybody... Yeah, cool. And, and, and shortly after, unrelated to um, this situation, right, old people, sorry, uh, a whole bunch of EV certificates were released on the dark web and there's a dark web shop offering EV certificates. <laughs> Oops. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and yep, cool, we're good. And a quick fact check around British Airways uh, breach that was nothing to do with S- HTL- HTTPS. <clears throat> um, it was to do with a broken JavaScript that was being consumed. So, 100% fact fail here. So this is an example. Find, find <coughs> the ads and sell your product. Don't do it. In your uncertainty. Yeah. Indeed, <clears throat> we might be talking about that later in the year. <laughs> But the good news is that good people exist. I'd like to think that most of the people in this room fall into that category one way or another. We, we certainly do. It's what we're here for. 
So there are things out there that are happening. Companies do look at security controls that they've got in place. Responsible disclosure is still finding its feet, I think it's fair to say, but it's there. Bug bounties exist. We've got a bit on that in a little while. <clears throat> there are other things. Okay, well, let's have a look. So can everybody see that picture of Ian? Maybe not so clear, this so, side of the building. Um, but yeah, MFA. So everyone knows what MFA is, right? Multi-factor authentication. You know it as two-step auth, two-factor auth, and so on. They'll roughly mean the same sort of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> the concept is something you know, something you have. So there's something you know where your username and password pair. And the something you have is an RSA token, a thing, an authenticator app on your mobile, that sort of stuff. An SMS message, okay? So you hear two sides of the debate. One is that SMS is crap. It's a really unsafe thing. It's, an un it's probably crap and unsafe if you work for a government, okay? But for my mum, it's probably pretty cool. I don't see anybody setting up a cell site or doing a SIM swap attack on my mum anytime soon. Or even me. She might. <clears throat> so the advice for organise... <coughs> The advice for organizations is where possible, deploy it. And we know there is an engineering piece involved, but do it if you can do it. As a consumer of sites and services, if it's available to you, damn right, get signed up to that. <clears throat> and a password breach is something you can probably survive if you've got MFA. Unless you're Twitter. Or Unless you're Twitter or Facebook. I said probably. So around responsible disclosure, companies have got to accept that they're not going to get it right 100% of the time. Um, tell us, you know, we've got, if we've got a, a responsible disclosure policy, go look for it. If we've got a security at firm.com email account, try it. If we've got, yep, yeah, if we've got well, dot well known slash security dot text <coughs> is a standard that should contain security contacts in case you find a bug or a problem on a web app. And, and make sure you keep in contact that's like really, really important because otherwise the developer, uh, the researcher is just going to get the hell in and disclose anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a debate around how long you give a firm. We can have that conversation after after hours. <clears throat> and, a, and a good firm will fix and keep in contact with the researcher. And we won't be 63 red. Okay. So, quick time check. <clears throat> Test and fix your stuff. So this is for organizations. I'm guessing a lot of you are, in, are going through the academic process at the moment, but this sort of information should sit somewhere in your consciousness for when you're out in the industry doing stuff, whether you're working as a pen tester, whether you're working as a, a blue team or a defender in an organization. <clears throat> These are things that you'll constantly come into contact with. So don't be fear, don't fear pen testing your processes within your company or your people. Okay, so these are all parts, important parts of the chain of security within an organization. It's not... Don't fear pen testing. General, quite often organizations uh, will fear pen testers. The developers are like, oh, these guys are going to come and break my shit. And it's like, well, actually, no, we're in here to point out problems, but also tell you how to fix your shit. So we're, we're helping you for the better and not making it worse. Sometimes you've got shit code and it drops all the tables, but that's your fault, not mine. So... <laughs> Yeah. Well, what you just to add to that, pen testing is not just about testing your application, it's testing your processes, making sure you have the right tests, your employees have the appropriate training, and so on and so forth. So pen testing is a vital part of your whole development process. Yeah, completely agree. <clears throat> so, yeah, get independent auditing. Don't be afraid of getting a private, uh, an independent company to come and tell you what you're doing wrong. It's absolutely vital. You need somebody marking your homework, otherwise you're going to live in this bubble of secure, of misplaced, <coughs> yeah, the false sense of security um, until you get attacked and breached. Bake your security in, so have adult conversations with people in the business about the relevance of security, and then bring those decisions into the design processes, whether it's a web app, whether it's a server, a network you're building, a new process you're implementing in the business, whatever, start at the very beginning, beyond the train at the first, when it leaves the station. Because too often we're not. We're brought in, uh, worst case scenario, when the shit's at the fan, um, or best case scenario, towards the end, when we're seen as a bit of a blocker. The second worst is like, we're going live tomorrow, we're doing pen testing today. Yep. That's the <coughs> yeah. That's when you get fixed Yep. And just one other point, as young developers, um, you should be aghast if you're using actual live customer data in your test and development environments. Yeah. Live customer data should be in production only. <coughs> yep. Patching. Okay. Patch everything. We're good. 
Okay, we'll move on. <clears throat> Have I been pwned? Anybody put their email account into here? Quick show of hands. Okay. I guarantee you'll have an email account that is in here. Um, it's great for sobering people up in the morning meeting when you want to talk about password security. Does anyone have one password? <coughs> Integrate with us. Let you know. I've only got one password. You should reference it. So one password is password manager. Integrations have been torn. Tells you if your password has been breached. It does. Other password managers are available. Um, <coughs> bug bounties. Do you want to say a quick 30 seconds on bug bounties? They're not pen testing. That's fine. Excellent. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> it's a way of monetizing and incentivizing people to do the right thing with a bug that they find rather than the wrong thing. Um, I think it's a, it's a paradigm shift, really. Before bug bounties existed, what did hackers do to monetize? They maybe sold data. Yeah, they're not pen testing, but you can make a fuck ton of cash doing them. Uh, yep. And also you help businesses get more secure and meet the net, safe again, and all that shit. Yeah. And, for, and, uh, and as a company... Yeah. As a security person in, that works in an organization that cares... Uh, it demonstrates you care. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah you can award <coughs> T-shirts or uh, Amazon gift cards or all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Okay, we're going to fly. <coughs> You're using up valuable time now, Ian. Okay, a breach is not a when, not an if. Um, a lot of organizations are already breached, but are unaware, blissfully unaware of the fact that their data is already out there. So it's going to happen, so make sure you're ready for it because that's what it'll feel like when it happens, Okay. And that's what your head like, might feel and look like. We all make mistakes, but how we respond to problems is what we'll be defined with or b defined by. <clears throat> so the truth is in there. A little reversal of an X-Files um, slogan. So the key things are accept it's happened. You know, it's a bit like the bereavement curve. Just accept it's happened. Don't sit there in denial. Don't start blaming other people when, quite frankly, it's probably your own control that failed or absence of control. Um, seek support. So head to your local CERT um, organization in the UK. It's the NCSC. Other CERTs are available. They can help you. You've got to notify the authorities. Okay. There are various timescales in which you've got opportunities to do that, but do it. And they can also, as well as receive your reporting, they can help you recover from the problem. <clears throat> Find out what happened and learn from it. That's critically important and take it on the chin and be adult about it. We've seen some really great breach notifications. So we should call those out. Some people do it well. There was one good one. Bit, bit of we test sex toys, we test a lot of our stuff. We found a cock cam, uh, basically a cock cam. Coming, coming on to that. Oh, yeah, shit. Anyway, <coughs> and uh, we reported it, and the, the, they took it off like, within like an afternoon. They stopped selling it. There you go. So that, that's, that's the product. You get a point of view of the stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, but they, they're now taking it in, and they, they've given us it to have a look at and some bits and pieces. So, yeah. You never want a camera anyway, but. He, he, you can uh, you can draw your own conclusions as to the use cases you may personally have for something like this. I'm making no comment whatsoever. Um, but it was, as Andy said, it was a good disclosure. It was received well by the company. Unfortunately, they did stop trading not long yeah, afterward. They're, they're trading against you. Go okay, so excellent. So they are available, freely available yeah, on, on the web. Um, just a point to one of um, your partners in this is going to be your insurance company. Um, and they will put you in touch with resources that you need if you are suffering a data breach, even if you don't have like cyber coverage. Uh, one thing, yeah. Um, who's uh, heard of the discuss breach? Very, very few. Who's heard of the Equifax breach? Yeah, significant. The difference being Equifax, how not to handle breach, <laughs> discuss handled it really well. So you're going to come out a lot better if you handle it well. Absolutely. And Time Hop did the same. Okay, really quickly, Norsk Hydro, this is hot off the press. They suffered a really bad ransomware attack last uh, earlier this week, last week. Um, but they didn't mess around. They responded really quickly. They came out and said, yes, we are under attack. We are looking at it. They didn't try and blame anybody. The comms was exceptional. They managed to open up new channels. They got an Azure website set up. They just said, yeah, we're under attack. Watch this space. And ultimately, they told the um, attackers to piss off. We're not paying your ransom. Vendors will give that a skip. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a tip for anybody in the community or anybody that's going to come into the community. So connect with it. Come to things like this. You know, I've been to a lot of conferences. We're now speaking at a lot of conferences. Um, B-sides and community events and university events are really where it's at. You'll meet the best people at these sort of things. You'll meet far better people here than you will at a large vendor. 
like, based. Things like, things like Infotech are great for free swag, but they're not great for actually talking. Agreed. <coughs> yep. Before engaging in debate, it's worth knowing what you're talking about because people will pick you apart if, well, <laughs> if you don't. And then respect. Yeah. Criticize? Well, quite. <coughs> Re respect other people know their things, so I'm, I'm, my, <laughs> my, yeah, exactly quite. My, my background is application security, but I've had to play a really quick game of catch up on other things like infrastructure security, etc. <clears throat> Engage and share. So even if, don't become a serial reposter because then you become a thought leader. <laughs> <clears throat> or an influencer and you appear in a list. Now no one wants to be in a list, right? But you see them, and the people that they apparently have like 150,000 Twitter followers and never tweet anything of their own. Okay, they only retweet and retweet and retweet. Be a serial shitposter, be one of us. Or a <laughs> no, but if you find something, if it's a document you found that might change somebody's life, one person's life changed for the better. In my book, is job done in this context. Okay, don't be a dick. Now it came up in Stu's talk. Just don't be a dick. You see a lot of it. Just don't be like that. <clears throat> But you've got to choose your moments and pick your battles. Be like the Bruce, the Bruce Dickinson, so that's the guy there. Yeah. And he's probably one of the reasons the bear farmers exist in the first place. And, and certainly why cowbell is our thing. <clears throat> and that's us done. So thank you for giving us your time and we hope yeah. you found it useful. <laughs> and, uh, I encourage you to get your mobile devices out right now and start getting some following on. If not us individually, but we'd appreciate it, of course. Certainly the bear farmers, so thanks. And now that thanks. we have a Facebook reach, we'll follow you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, have we got any questions? Oh, yeah. Anybody got a question? They never do. But it's because they're just yeah, sit, they're sitting there going, what the fuck have I just witnessed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we do have, and this is going to be fun, we do have what remains of our swag down there, which is the stickers you've been individually handed out by Professor Ian here. Um, but we've brought some drumsticks. There are 20 in number. So, so who's graduating this year? Ooh. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Keep your hands up. This is the way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you've got it. Yeah, Ian, Ian, trust but verify, okay? Yeah. Put your hand up. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Ian. 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 The, young, the young lady there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well done, Ian. Oh, he's not lucky. Don't, don't throw him. Don't throw him. Don't throw him. I made that mistake. We, 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 we've, already get, we've already got two lawsuits against us for that. That's created a bit of a riot, hasn't it? <laughs> okay. Okay, guys, that's us. Thank you very much.